wonder what makes the greats great what makes the successful successful what makes the brilliant brilliant our tuesday meetups with the celebrities of pharma industry and science are your one stop shop to all these answers and more join us for pies of life an initiative of the biopatrika industry mentorship program where we bring your dream mentors to you this is a very very important area for the world and especially for india as you know covid itself has told us that uh, healthcare is so so very important to understand um and you know that uh, you know there, there's a lot of focus now on life sciences because we need to understand much more about biological processes and you also know that we may be the most high tech country in the world but if you don't have good health you can see that no technology has been able to really overcome covid covid is an invisible virus right and now we realize that this invisible virus has played havoc with humanity and the world and it has brought the whole world to a grinding halt and now it is science that is going to find ways of combating this virus and in this scientific pursuit it's not just about biological sciences but there's a convergence of technologies right and what is beautiful about the opportunity for all of us working in science and technology is the fact that the convergence of technology is allowing us to do things which we could never think of in the past so when you think about just covid 19 and looking at how technology is allowing us to do contact tracing how technology is allowing us to basically have a much higher level of pandemic preparedness because as you get data from different parts of uh you know the ecosystem you can actually know where the hot spots are how you should do uh, containment when can you open up how should you open up all these things can be done with technology but at the same time we also know that to do all of this you also need to be able to test now the testing is done by using rt pcr and many other technologies which can measure the virus right and in order to measure the virus you have to be able to pick up the fragments of rna the virus is rna through various technologies and that's why today you're seeing many 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 technologies coming to the fore and that's again about scientific experimentation that's about young scientists looking at this opportunity and say how quickly can i do this test how can i get this antigen this viral antigen and measure it fast and measure it in different ways so that itself has made you realize what the power of understanding science and understanding biological sciences is all about then we've seen that covid itself is a very very difficult disease because it has two phases of the disease about 80% of the people get away with uh just dealing with the virus so that's like a normal flu and how a, a body uh, deals with a normal flu but then you've got a second phase of the disease where the virus actually causes havoc where the virus triggers what is called as a hyper immune cytokine response and that is actually causing a much graver complexity of the of the of covid than just the virus itself and that phase of the disease is what is killing people because the overactive immune system can cause a what is called as a cytokine storm and as you know when a cytokine storm is created it can uh, lead to organ failure so it damages parts of your uh, 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 your body causing huge amounts of uh, life threatening complications so we know for a fact that the cytokines are causing vascular damage pulmonary damage gastrointestinal damage and then that is actually leading to many many other kinds of complications so you're seeing 
lung fibrosis set in, you're seeing sort of uh, blood clots happening, uh, killing people. And you're seeing also a lot of gastric, uh, you know, damage taking place. Uh, and ultimately, all this is leading to organ failure and causing death. So, you know, as we go treating this disease, we know that initially we didn't know what was happening. Personally, I don't even think people should get on to ventilators because this is not about giving more oxygen. This is really about getting rid of the inflammation and the cytokines, right? So as scientists, we need to understand these diseases better and not just treat the symptoms. Today, what's happening is that doctors are just treating symptoms. So when people are breathless, they're giving more oxygen. But that is not the reason for the breathlessness. The breathlessness is because of inflammation, where your entire pulmonary, uh, you know, alveoli and uh, uh, the whole pulmonary tracts are all inflamed. And because they are inflamed, you're not able to take in oxygen very easily. And if you get rid of the inflammation, you don't have a problem with the, uh, the oxygen levels. But what I'm trying to say is, as, a, as medical, uh, you know, as, as students of medical science, as students of biology, we need to understand and learn a lot more about these diseases than just doing a textbook kind of learning. So I think all, many of you are at ACTREC. And I would really urge all of you that you need to look beyond what you're taught. Okay, you need to question, you need to query. I know some of you are looking at cervical cancer, some of you are looking at oral cancers, uh, one of you is looking at a brain, pediatric uh, brain tumor. Now, all this is a very difficult area, and you have to look at what is it that is so difficult to treat because. You know, as we all know, today, cancer is very well regarded as an immunological disorder. Okay. It is not the, 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 the poor understanding of cancer in yesteryears where it just used to be that, oh, for some reason, it, you know, these cells have gone out of control. And now we have to bombard these cells with chemotherapy or with radiotherapy. Today, we know that these cells are going crazy because something in the immune system has gone crazy. The triggers that normally or the, or the, or the kind of checks and balances that the immune system has, has somehow gone out of control. So we need to know how to bring back those controls. And that's why a lot of the immuno, uh, um, immuno-oncology approaches are very exciting because we are beginning to understand what the immune system is all about. I think for all of you who are looking at cancer, I think the real opportunity is immuno-oncology immuno because the immune system is an amazing system. Okay, It's a very complex system. It's, it's the most complex computer which can beat any computational uh, expert Okay, because it is just so multiplexed and it is so, in, you know, sort of um, multidimensional in the way it works. So I think you have to understand the immune system better. And as you understand the immune system better, you will get more and more understanding and more and more answers to many of these cancers that we can't treat today. Now, I can tell you that all of us have to be lifelong learners. You know, I myself am a lifelong learner. And I know for a fact that I have been fascinated with immunology just in the last few years. In the last few years, my interest and understanding of immunology has significantly increased. But I know it's just the tip of the iceberg that I understand. Because the immune system is formidable, it is daunting. And there is something in it for everyone to understand. Please understand that, if, that when you look at people who win Nobel Prizes, they win Nobel Prizes because they understand in depth a very critical mechanism that makes all the difference, right? And what I'm trying to tell all of you is that every one of you has an opportunity to study science in depth. Um, Amoga is here and I wanted to talk about clinical psychology. So COVID has also told us that there is a huge psychological burden that it has brought onto all of us because uh, we don't know how to cope with this disease. But the one big thing we must all understand is we are all in it together. 
it's not that only i am alone in my quarantined zone or only we are housebound it is not like that i think all of us need to understand that we have to fight it together it is not about just one person being alone it's many many people who have had to quarantine themselves i myself went through a a very rigorous quarantine process because i went through covid right but i didn't let that get me down because i knew psychologically i was very strong i said no this is a viral disease and i'm as long as i track this viral disease and as i as far as i as long as i know what to do i'm not going to get scared and i'm sure with my fitness and my health i'll be fine and sure enough i got over it very with very uh, with a very moderate dose of the disease and more importantly i didn't feel alone I, you know all of us have phones today and you know that it is not uh, it is so easy to call up somebody i mean i was calling up my family 10 times a day and everyone was asking me how are you feeling i was like fine now leave me alone i want to watch this netflix movie you know so i was doing a lot of uh, things to keep myself busy i was even attending webinars a lot of people say are you got covid why are you attending this webinar i said what i'm not dying no i can speak i can participate i'm not feeling so tired and so fatigued that uh, i can't even be on a webinar i did many many webinars on uh, while i was having covid okay i did many tv interviews on covid no. so i'm just saying that you need to feel a sense of control and confidence you should not give up you should not just feel so helpless that you feel that uh, you know nothing can be done oh my god is this going to be terrible am i going to die oh am i going to get up get, get into hospital now i don't think that's the way you have to look after yourself and get that confidence yes if thing if if, if you can't breathe you will have to check yourself into a hospital but you know there can be good i mean i my advice to everybody is don't wait as soon as you feel unwell please get yourself tested please get yourself treated believe me nobody has to feel breathless if you treat yourself early the people who are actually becoming serious are the ones who are in denial the ones who go very late to the hospital the ones who treat test themselves very very late those are the ones who are actually suffering but i can tell you in the last two weeks or three weeks as you can imagine ever since i uh, my covid story became known i have had at least 50 people ringing me up saying what should i do what should i do and i can tell you every one of those 50 people is fine <laughs> so i just want you to know that life is about self confidence life is about making sure that you follow the science life is about understanding what you're doing you cannot be panicking you cannot be ad hoc and you cannot be irrational that's the advice i will give to all you young people please question please query please find answers and please be problem solvers don't expect everyone to tell you what to do yeah you know i think that's my strong message to all of you because you are all educated people you have all studied well and it is about finding your answers it is about solving problems it is about making sure that even if you have a setback you learn how to deal with it and how to then come out with it stronger there are always opportunities i have actually been through a number of setbacks okay i have been through a number of uh, doors being shown at me saying sorry we we can't uh, help you we can't uh, offer you a job we can't give you a financial assistance but do you think that's got me down no i realized that for whatever reason i i couldn't get in i couldn't get into medical college i couldn't uh, uh, you know get a uh, uh, i couldn't get a job as a broom master i couldn't uh, get a loan from a bank i couldn't get people to work for me i i couldn't do so many things but that didn't keep me down i felt okay if i can't do this i'll do this and i always figured out ways of coming over those challenges so i want all of you to know that life is not a bed of roses and i always believe that with every challenge every obstacle it gives you a learning opportunity which is very valuable i can tell you if none of you have failures or if none of you has fa have faced any kind of obstacle in your life i feel sorry for you 
because you won't learn very much but if you actually face failures if you feel if you face roadblocks if you face things which didn't go right you will learn and through that learning you will become big better stronger and you'll have much more a uh, confidence because when you finally overcome that challenge you'll feel a sense of fulfillment that's what i've always felt and that's what keeps keeps me grounded and keeps me moving ahead so yeah. i'll stop there and ask you for your questions yeah. uh, and i'll just moderate the questions that it was right i will ask you first so why don't you go ahead and ask your question uh, let's let's stick to one question we'll go two rounds if we can okay. so uh, hello ma'am so yeah um given you have so many achievements in your life so which one will you pick up as your the one which you are uh, most proud of or take the most pride in and why the reason for it no i think every award is a very special award in its own way if you know what i mean i can't pick one and say this is more important than the other and that's one thing i must also share with all of you that in life each thing has a certain meaning and each thing has a certain context so obviously if i were to talk about national awards obviously they are very important because it's a national recognition in a country like india you've been picked up from a billion people right so that's a huge honor right so my padma shri and padma bhushan obviously is a huge honor for me because a padma shri i got when i was in in 1989 i got it you know and i was uh, you know hardly 34 years old at that time um so uh, 35 i was so i'm just saying at that time to get a national award for biotechnology and for being a pioneer in biotechnology was a huge huge accolade who would have ex expected it right and i was one of the few women entrepreneurs so it was a huge honor for me to be recognized by my own country among so many people that you know as a young woman who was trying to start a biotech business i was actually noticed and recognized and acknowledged so that was one of my most special awards and then of course in 2005 i got the padma bhushan which was really to say that it's not just about being recognized but now you've built a something scalable and sizable and of national pride and national importance so that was a very big um, you know meaningful accolade for me and then i got two other national awards one was from france and one was from australia so you can imagine when you get recognized with national honors of other countries that is a very big moment of pride as well so i would say national honors have always been very very important to me because it is a global recognition and then of course i would say that my recent award which i got from ernst and young as the entrepreneur of the world entrepreneur of the year was a big big recognition even though people said to me in fact the jury itself in, in ernst and young said to me you won every award that is worth winning so what is so important about this award they asked me and i said look this is an entrepreneur's dream award right because if you're acknowledging me as a world entrepreneur wow what a, a tribute is that so it's great winning such an award and then of course i worked i won so many other awards like you know i got the othma gold prize for uh, chemistry uh, i've got uh, so many other such awards which i think are very very important awards but out of all of them i would say these were some of the special awards that are worth mentioning for the reasons i said thank you thank you good akshay why don't you go ahead hi um first of all i want to thank you so much for uh, giving your time and uh, being able to talk to us uh, about these things so um narin sir has been a great mentor to all of us and we learned a lot from him so i'm sure through your journey you had a lot of mentors of your own and what would be the lesson that the most valuable lesson that you had taken back from your mentor see i want to share with you the word mentor has to be looked at very differently you know i think the reason you uh, the, the reason you call narin a good mentor is because narin basically shares a lot of you know important learnings with you okay and i have always 
looked at mentors as people whom I can brainstorm with. I don't want to ask a mentor, what should I do? Do you think I'm doing the right thing? Where do you think I should be doing the next thing? That's not a mentor. That's absolutely not a mentor. According to me, a mentor is somebody with whom you can brainstorm. Talk about your frustrations. Talk about what you want to do. Just use them as a sounding board and see whether it resonates with, with people. And I've had many such people. And not everyone is someone I'm looking for giving me advice. I look at mentors as people from whom I can draw inspiration. That to me is a mentor. So I remember when I was building Biocon, I used to have many of these people who used to inspire me. I, I'll tell you, uh, uh, Dr. Mashelkar. Okay, Dr. Mashelkar was a great inspirational person for me and he still continues to be a very dear friend of mine and we inspire each other. Okay, but he inspired me a lot because I'll tell you why. I felt that here is a man who has been given this huge responsibility of running CSIR, which is such, which at that time was such a complex and, uh, you know, sort of um, a floundering kind of organization. It never had, it never commanded any respect. It was just a bunch of labs who are not doing mediocre stuff. And every time they would say, what a waste of money investing in science and technology. And yet directors were given this job of saying, run these places, run these laboratories. I first met him when he was the director of the National Chemical Laboratory in, in Pune, which was a big universe, a big institute. But I remember when I first met him, Dr. Mashelkar said to me, you know, Kiran, do me a favor. And I was very young. I was in my 30s when I met him. And he said, do me a favor. I said, sure. I, he said, just talk to my academic, uh, my, my senior uh, academic uh, colleagues and inspire them and, and shake them up and tell them they have to do something about applying their knowledge because none of them is doing that. You know, they're either doing some research in their ivory towers and they don't think it's necessary to think about society at all. They're just interested in publishing. And he said, I'm trying to tell them, you know, you, you are in an institute which can make such big impact on society and they don't understand it. So tell them. And, you know, I was a chutta for girl. Can you imagine me talking to this, you know, this, this auditorium full of you know, sort of gray-haired academic, uh, academicians. And yet, uh, uh, Mashelkar said to me, no, you have to do me this favor. You have to shake them up. So I went and I just gave them a talk on what I felt that we should do as, as academic centers from, uh, from India. What should we do and why, how we should re rejuvenate and make our centers of learning vibrant. And so I just gave them a talk and, you know, Mashelkar said, you know, even I was so inspired listening to you. And ever since then, we've, been, we've become such close friends. Today, whatever I do, whatever he does, we always share our exchange, our views on various things. So he was a big, in a way, if you call that a mentor, he was a mentor because we used, I used to bounce a lot of ideas off him. And he used to bounce a lot of ideas off me as well. And then, of course, Mr. Vagul, who helped me in my company because he believed in my technology. He, he believed in my entrepreneurial uh, energy. And he's the one that actually invested in me. So I always used to consider him a mentor. If there's ever someone I considered a mentor, it was him. Not because I used to keep asking him what I should do, but because I used to exchange. I mean, I used to share a lot of my ideas and my frustrations and my my excitement about technology, which he used to understand. And then he would say, yeah. And then he would advise me saying, you know, I'm going to help you. But by the way, you haven't asked for enough. I'm going to give you more than what you've asked for and things like that. So he was my really good mentor. And then even today, I have a lot of people whom I bounce a lot of ideas with. So for instance, uh, Dr. Bala Manian, who used to be on our board, He's an amazing man. I mean, he and I, we call each other, you know, soulmates because every week we talk about a new idea and he's always giving, he's always educating me about something or the other, which is so novel. 
recently, Sid Mukherjee and I have become very close. Siddharth Mukherjee is a very famous uh, oncologist in, in New York. And he and I bounce ideas so much from uh, across each other. I mean, Nare knows that. And, uh, you know, every week, at any time of the day or night, I know if I see a phone call from Sid Mukherjee, I know he's got some idea. So he'll say, I just thought of this. What do you think? And then I'll say, okay, it's a great idea. Or no, maybe we should look at it this way. Or sometimes I would get an idea and I'll call him up. And suddenly I realize, oh my God, it's 11 o'clock at night for Siddharth. Maybe it's too late. So I'll quickly switch off. Then he'll call me back. What happened? Did you just call me? I said, yeah, yeah, but I realized it's too late. No, 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 don't worry. I'm still awake. Tell me, tell me, tell me. And then we'll have a long chat. So, you know, there are so many of these kind of people. Another friend of mine is Bob Langer. He's an amazing uh, uh, scientist in MIT. There's another friend of mine, Sangeeta Bhatia in MIT. So I have so many different friends who I find very inspirational. You know, whom I can just pick up the phone and speak to them and say, what do you think of this? But these kind of people don't just arrive. They, they engage with you because there's a connect. They connect with you because they know you're genuine. And they connect with you because you know they know that you just want something to share with them. See, so mentorship is about sharing knowledge. It's about bouncing ideas of each other. And it's about being inspired. Okay. So you must also remember that if you want a true member, a mentor, you also have to inspire the mentor. It cannot be a one way street because that is not true mentorship. Because the mentor will only help you if they feel inspired by what you're doing. So true. So true. Kiran. Very well. Uh, Shabnam, why don't you go ahead? I know. You Hello. My question is, I'm being a woman, but obstacle did you face? And how did you deal with that? See, I, you can read about this in many, 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 many interviews that I've given. Yeah. But I think to answer your question, look, don't just focus on being a woman and the obstacles. Okay. I can tell you that if you have a, a great idea, if you have a great sense of purpose, nothing can stop you. Okay. And I really want to say this to all the women here. Please stop thinking that just because I'm a woman, you know, I'm going to have a lot of problems. Yes, everybody has problems. Women have more problems than men. I agree. But that shouldn't stop you. Okay. I had a lot of problems. Nobody wanted to work for a woman when I started my company. No bank wanted to give me money because they said, you're a woman. You don't have any money in the bank. You don't have any experience. How can we give you money? I had a lot of those ex uh, problems. But do you think it stopped me? No. When you are possessed by an idea, when you're possessed by that sense of purpose, nothing can stop you. So please don't think about it and don't make it as an excuse because women always use this as an excuse saying, oh, you know, but I can't do this because I'm a woman. I said, bullshit, that's not true. I said, you are your problem. You are in that mindset trap that, oh, because I'm a woman, I can't do this or I can't do that. Get out of that mind uh, trap. Get out of that mindset. Because if you are good and if you believe in yourself and you're pursuing science with a sense of purpose, nothing can stop you. And that is equally true for a man or a woman. Yeah, so true. Hello, ma'am. Uh, yeah, so actually I don't have any question, but uh, just three or four days back, I got detected positive for COVID. And right now I'm on medication. I was I just read your blog two days be before. It was really motivating. And that's what means I started attending webinars. And then uh, today also, that's the only reason I told that I'll come online. And I'll, because just sitting and sleeping and taking medications, it really... No, no, you to please exercise. When I was taking... A when I had COVID, I was doing regular exercise. I was going for a three kilometer walk every day. Okay. Okay. So don't sit and sleep. Go and exercise. Try and walk as much as you can. Do even if you can't go out, at least do your 10,000 steps if you can. Yeah, so I just walk in my room because I'm so yeah. isolated. Yeah. So, but why can't you go out wearing a mask? Uh, no, actually, uh, our society will not allow us okay, to go fine. out. So if yeah. they don't allow it, at least walk in your room or whatever. Yes. And you can yeah. do some uh, uh, 
uh, you know, uh, exercises in your room, do yoga. I did all that. And okay. do that. If you can do Kapal Bhati, do that. It's very good for. Food. Yeah, I do that every morning. So uh, uh, you'll my be mom, fine. You are very yeah. young, and you'll be fine in no time. <clears throat> Okay. Yes, yes. That vlog was very helpful for me. Thank you so much for that. Okay. Sivaram and then Amoga next. Hello, ma'am. Ma'am, I just wanted to know in your entrepreneurial journey, like did any situation came which made you feel you need to give up and how you handled that? I told you that I'm not the person to give up. <laughs> and obviously, I've had a lot of uh, uh, times when uh, things didn't go well, some failures happened. But that is to be expected in any journey, any, I mean, your life is full of failures. I mean, nobody's life can be such a dream life that nothing goes wrong in your life. Yes. Right. Okay. And when something does go wrong, you learn how to come out of it. Yes. So I am not the kind of entrepreneur who will give up at the drop of a hat or if there's something very seriously wrong. Uh, I just think you need to understand that there will be pitfalls along the way and you have to overcome that. Yeah, uh, I'm going to ask Amoga to ask the question about uh, the mental health. Yeah, uh, so I wanted to ask, ma'am, that what is your idea or your thoughts on mental health and its awareness in our country? And how you think it is? So I think, you know, mental health is a serious problem in our country because we don't even acknowledge it. And we believe that uh, everyone has to cope with their own mental health problems, especially if it is, uh, if it is uh, serious. Um, I know that, uh, you know, there is a, a clinical uh, mental health issue and there is a transient mental health issue. So as you know, uh, you know, either we sort of uh, belittle mental health by saying, Are, yaar, you know, why should she be depressed? Why should that person be depressed? And we don't even look at it as an illness. I mean, today, if you say, uh, I have a headache, a lot of people can say, why should you have a headache? Are yaar, just take one paracetamol and you'll be fine. Yes. The same way, even if you're depressed, you might need to take some medication to come out of it. We must understand that a lot of what we feel is a chemical process in our mind, in our bodies. And therefore, if there's a chemical imbalance, I just talked about cancer being a, uh, you know, an immunological imbalance. Similarly, if you look at mental health, it's a chemical imbalance. And that chemical imbalance causes a lot of unexpected and abnormal emotions. And it is, it is about your, uh, your, your neurological system where you know, either the neural signals are very slow or too fast or whatever is happening, but they are all basically because you're producing or not producing enough chemicals. So I think you need to look at mental health much more seriously than what you're doing right now. There are very serious things going on in our society. Like look at the suicide uh, levels in our society. That's not a good sign at all. It means that we are not really looking at mental health issues in a real way. We are not do, you know, going about psychologically counseling people to get out of this mental health uh, problem. So I think clinical psychology is extremely important. And I think trained, a training in clinical psychology to be a good clinical psychologist is very, very important for our country. Secondly, I think we need to look at every aspect of mental health. Some are very serious, like say schizophrenia and you know, that kind of level of violence. And then you have other levels of uh, uh, mental health, which can be, which are transient and which you can correct very easily. So I think it is a very important issue and we need to give it far more uh, importance and focus than we are doing today especially in rural India. As you know, anyone with a little bit of a mental health problem is ostracized from society. And they need not because they can be perfectly normal if they get medication and they can come back and lead perfectly normal lives. But we are very mean as a society and we ostracize people very easily without giving them a chance to recover. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry to uh, add on a question. I just have a follow-up question. Uh, 
can you suggest some ways in which you think are good ways where we can spread the awareness and importance more well i think there's a lot being done uh, i myself am a part of uh, the live love laugh foundation and there we are trying to do a lot we are working with the government and with uh, uh, you know various ngos to spread the awareness of mental health i know that we did an exercise in davangiri in 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 six districts and there now what we've done is from nimhans every uh, wednesday there is a psychologist who goes there and meets with the people gives them medication follows them up and i can tell you it's made a big difference to a lot of the people who came with this mental health issue and there were a large number of people even in all these poor districts hello ma'am uh, my question is that what was that uh, idea or that turning point which triggered you to be an entrepreneur i always tell people it was just an accidental encounter i couldn't get a job and one entrepreneur from ireland came and offered me an opportunity to start a business and because i was so upset and angry i said why not and that's how i started a company oh good that's a big success thank you ma'am uh, raji you're on uh yes uh ma'am uh, what are your views about scientific culture in india and uh, is it really nourishing young minds to be an entrepreneur and if no what changes would you suggest in the education system throughout to bring up that change in the society and to the uh, educational system in india see first and foremost our education itself should be curiosity driven you know it should not be about uh, passing an exam and and rote learning which is what has been the style of education and i think the national education policy is actually addressing all this and they are actually telling us that it should be curiosity driven it should be project led and i think once you start from that kind of education from school believe me the rest of it becomes much simpler i mean i owe my uh, curiosity driven education to my school in bangalore okay it's not that i went abroad to be uh, to have this uh, kind of uh, thinking i uh, studied at bishop cotton girls school and i can tell you that all my teachers used to make us think they would ask us uh, to solve problems so i think having that problem solving curiosity driven learning approach is the way to make people think and uh, improve their scientific temper i think for far too long in our country we only focused on marks and those marks have always been about theory uh, you know pro uh, theory courses like here's a written exam and let's see how many marks you get here we've never really focused on projects or practicals that are equally balanced i remember even in college practicals were only like uh, i think 25% of all our marks and yet i used to find the practicals very challenging and very interesting and even in the theory classes in in college i must say even when i went to bangalore university it was a very curiosity driven education we had those days because our professors used to actually give us uh projects to do at home even if they were theory they would say okay uh and it was very interesting they would say okay uh this is uh, i'm giving each one of you a, a a a subject i want you to learn this subject as deeply as you can and come and give a a, a lecture in in the in the to the rest of your uh, colleagues i thought that was a very nice way of getting us to learn a lot about uh, the subject and they would give a little uh, uh, prize to the best presenter or the best uh, uh, teacher nice nice good good idea uh, like my and is like ma'am uh, till how uh, much extend ma'am like uh, your family support has helped you ma'am you so have to have some family support i mean my yeah. father was my biggest supporter my mother of course was a great support and i think uh, they really encouraged me to go out and uh, do something with my life in fact my father i felt was the most liberated man whom i've ever known my throughout my life 
because he told me when I was growing up, he said, you know, don't be like the rest of your friends and only focus on getting married because that was how it was in my times, right? Everyone wanted their daughters to get married. He's saying, now don't be like your friends, let them get married, but I want my daughter to do well and pursue a career. So when you have a father who thinks like that, I think it's a great support. He said, look, you've educated yourself, you've done so well, don't waste your education. Yeah. And I think that message holds true for all of us today. <laughs> that education is so precious in our country that if you waste your education by sitting at home and if your parents are telling you, Achha, beti, koi baat nahi, you, are, you can get married and stay at home, I think we are wasting an education. Hi ma'am, thanks for uh, giving us your valuable time. Uh, I, you have been always the source of inspiration for all of us, especially to join biotech. Uh, question is, uh, what one thing in Indian biotech in industry you feel can be rectified or should be changed to make us a global, like uh, the way Biocon is emerging as a, uh, as a global player, all rest of the bio, uh, biotech companies can be? No, I don't think, uh, you know, I think the biotech sector has to grow and evolve. And I think biotech entrepreneurs have to basically understand what the opportunity is, what, you know, you have to basically pick on a problem and try and solve that problem. And can you make a business of it? That's the way I've always looked at building my business. And I think biotech offers you all that. I mean, look at today in COVID, how many companies are trying to create uh, test kits, how many people are trying to create those uh, uh, reagents for, uh, for uh, test kits, how many people are even trying to just create those viral transmission modules, how many people have made businesses out of anything to do with vaccine development. There's so much for everyone to do. So I don't think there's a dearth of ideas. And in a country like India, where we have huge healthcare challenges, you know, solving every one of those problems is an entrepreneurial opportunity. So that's the way I would look at biotech. And the only thing that biotech needs is a proper ecosystem because right now only the government is funding risk capital. But we need to create an ecosystem where the venture funds also a thing or you should be able to borrow from a bank like I did. Hello, ma'am. Yeah. So uh, my question is, like uh, in a country like India, the academia and industry are two different worlds. So in academia, the research is only focused, uh, you know, uh, to the publishing uh, aspect, and uh, there's little of translational uh, uh, aspect to it. So uh, I mean, what would be done to uh, gap this bridge? Uh, what are your opinions? Actually, on that's this? not true. Because, you know, because I think that in acad, no, that's not entirely true. I mean, if you look at uh, what's happening today, you look at what CCMB has done, right? They've come up with that Feluda test and they've partnered with Tata's. You've come up with a large number of tests, even vaccines are now being partnered. So there's a lot happening actually today, thanks to COVID, where academia suddenly realizes it can actually contribute a lot and industry feels that, oh, if academia has got this, let's take it to the market. So at last, this kind of realization and recognition is coming. But I think ACTREC needs to do that because you're doing so much research in ACTREC, but that needs to translate into a, 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 a commercial opportunity. So that's the only thing which I would suggest that you need to push ACTREC into doing because ACTREC is doing very well in terms of research and clinical understanding, but that has to translate also into something which is, you know, entrepreneurial, something that will actually make a difference uh, to cancer patients. Hello, ma'am. Uh, good afternoon. Yeah, ma'am, uh, I just wanted to ask you, like, uh, do you see any potential for uh, like novel research in biopharma in India in the future? Like we're mostly stuck with still the biosimilars. So uh, That's do you not see- true. That's not true. A lot of companies are developing novel products. Okay. I mean, uh, our own journey in biologics started with novel products. So Biocon could not have been a leading biosimilars company if we hadn't developed uh, novel biologics before that. So uh, we have two products. One is, of course, uh, Itolizumab, which is, uh, you know, being used for COVID patients. 
and it is being used for a number of autoimmune diseases including in the us they are finding that it's very effective against uh, graft versus host disease and it uh, is being applied for as a breakthrough drug so which means that yes. this is something coming out of our own labs here and then we have another very fine drug called uh, nimotizumab which is being which was which has been used extensively in head and neck cancers and nasopharyngeal cancers and actually tata uh, tata memorial did do a very large trial but like everything in india we never really um, you know have confidence in our own home ground products and today nimotizumab has far greater recognition in china than in india you know which is very sad because we constantly run after drugs which are developed in the us and not in india and i think that's the confidence we need to uh, bring into our country because uh, uh, we need we need to really think about what we are doing in terms of innovation and not just us but i think the whole system has to recognize it yeah i think we we'll need some more uh, i guess support from the government in terms of no, and there are lots of companies doing wonderful things i can tell you all the startups in bangalore that i look at there are these breakthrough antimicrobials that are being developed by bugworks but who is recognizing them not india it is being recognized by uh, you know uh, nih is being recognized by the welcome trust it is being recognized by all these various global entities but not india okay yes so i think that is the big deficiency we have in our country because we have got that colonial mindset starting with our doctors our doctors only want to prescribe uh, you know western drugs they don't want to prescribe uh, indigenous drugs so those kind of that mentality has to change then only you'll see more novel drugs otherwise i can tell you there's so much novel research going on in in bangalore itself i've seen five or six companies who are doing some amazing work but they are struggling because they are no takers for their research and all of them have to finally go abroad to uh, to get their uh, you know novelty so kiran are you spiritual and what do you feel about spirituality and 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 how does that play in, in daily life i don't think i got to that level of being spiritual i mean i am very god fearing but not spiritual um i enjoy a lot of uh, um let's put it this way i i enjoy classical music hindustani classical music i enjoy a lot of uh, uh you know good downtime i enjoying music you know like i i enjoy bhajans and things but i don't do it for a spiritual reason okay i enjoy it from the you know the raga point of view or from the or from the musical point of view so i would not call myself spiritual at all So now you know I have to let everybody know when I joined Biocon right in the beginning Kiran had didn't even know me much at that time and you know I'm she now you now she knows that I'm very into music so I made her sing one song in one of those board meetings and you sang that song uh, those were the days my friends <laughs> so nice <laughs> uh, no, and also you know that I you know I never do anything without uh, bhumi puja I don't do anything without a ganesha in my every part every room I am in so those kind of things yes but that's not spiritual you know that's just yeah yeah uh, right right you had you said you had a question yeah yeah so this is ma'am this is a very specific question which i had for you so you uh, the bicon itself is about uh, you know integrating innovation with affordability is that's the tagline so how do you do that like something like uh car t cells where you are actually genetically modifying a patient's own cell to evade the cancer how do you bring affordability in that kind of a so that is the innovation no you have to think when you have a goal you have to innovate to think how are you going to achieve it yes and you have to you, make it you have to know where is your benchmark and what are the costs you can you can reduce and do it well because you don't want to sacrifice quality so okay. my motto has always been highest quality at lowest cost because we are in india yeah so uh i know it's we are, we are just uh, two minutes more anyone anyone has any burning question otherwise we'll ask kiran for the, her last few thoughts neel burning question <laughs> so let me end by just saying that all of you have a great future 
you have to you know seize those opportunities and you have to create those opportunities yeah okay so all the best thank you thank, thank you thank you a network should last a lifetime let us help you create lasting professional relationships with our world class mentors through the biopatrika industry mentorship program a strategic guidance program unlike no other full of expert interviews industry internship opportunities cv writing inflection point analysis life maps and of course the gateway to your dream career for a limited time only all our services are freely available for you as we truly want you to succeed Thank you.